Good morning, everybody. Um, I am getting ready and thought I would jump on and chat. I've been wanting to do more lives, but um, you know, if you've ever created anything yourself, um, you can get really stuck in the like waiting for a right time or for things to be set up or convenient, and um, you know that never happens. So. Um, I'm doing my makeup. I'm gonna film some videos today and decided um, let's just chat. It's been a really long time since I've published um, anything of really you know substantial content on YouTube. So I just wanted to chat with everybody and um, get to know some of the followers uh, that have come in in the last, God, what has it been? Eight months, seven to eight months, at least six months. So, um, if you are new to me, I think most of you have come in through like one of a handful of videos. Most of these have been these like blanket videos about like okra or sorghum or chickpeas. So um, I really like doing those. I think that's really helpful when you're trying to get to know a new ingredient and you just don't know where to start. And um, the whole channel is built on this philosophy of if you can understand basics or technique, then as you become more comfortable with that, then you have a lot more space to experiment with different things in your own taste, or you feel more comfortable trying brand new recipes. And I decided to create the channel, um, we're going on like eight years now. Um, I decided to create the channel because uh, as someone who just enjoyed food and cooking at home, I realized that some recipes, it's really hard to tell like what they mean if you don't know how to cook, you know, the difference between sweating an onion versus browning an onion. You know, if you're brand new to cooking, it can be really frustrating to think that you followed a recipe um, pretty, pretty closely and it doesn't turn out the way you thought it would. And it, you know, sometimes recipes are, are written poorly and sometimes you're just not a great cook or like you just, you just don't know what you don't know. So I created the channel to create this visual guide of recipes um, paired with, you know, I've tried this recipe and here's what I thought about it and do I like how it's written or would I do things differently? And then over time, you could learn to trust my tastes and then trust my recommendations over things. That was the whole idea of the YouTube video of the channel. Um, and yeah, it's been fun. I um, have tried not to focus on particular types of recipes or, or food. I really just wanted to focus on vegetables and because um, we all need more vegetables in our life, uh, no matter what you like to eat or what your dietary dogma is. So that's where I started focusing. Um, and then because I like to travel a lot, I decided, you know, I actually really enjoy experiencing traditional foods and then um, bringing that into my own home in some way. Um, it reminds me of, you know, a fabulous vacation or a particular memory um, and also just, I find, you know, stuff like that is interesting. So, um, I need to start doing my makeup. Um, anyhow, I think the last video I posted was something about fried bay leaves, um, which I had at a restaurant here in New York City, but um, it was a Catalonian Spanish recipe, um, sorry, restaurant here in New York. And um, that's from Northern Spain. And we um, have also traveled to Spain um, a couple of times in recent months, becoming a huge, huge fan of that country and their food. Um, you know, it's largely familiar because it's, it's pork based and I'm from the American South where we are also heavily pork based. Um, but then, you know, it's just, there's, it's such an old culture that's been heavily influenced by a number of um, other cultures, um, you know, you've got French in the North and African in the South, um, and it all kind of comes together in the middle, but the fried bay leaves were really interesting. And apparently you can do it with, um, lemon leaves, like lemon tree leaves. You get the same essence that finds its way into the, the batter around the leaf. Um, but while I was in Barcelona, and I have this recipe filmed, I just haven't done the rest of the process where I write the script and film the talking head and then publish the video, but that's gonna be the first thing I get to. Um, I had a dish in Barcelona back in August, tomato tartare, um, 
which had all of the seasonings and yeah hey christopher yeah i didn't realize i this is my first live stream i want to try it more um so yeah um and hopefully more with like actually cooking things right now i'm just putting on some makeup and giving it a shot um but yeah, uh, we were in Barcelona and had this tomato tartare, all the seasonings of your regular like <laughs> beef tartare. So like Dijon mustard, um, cornichon, um, I forget what else I put in there now, but, um, and then it's just tomatoes instead of beef. Um, so I had to do some experimenting because the consistency, the texture that we had of the tartare at the restaurant um, you know, tomatoes are really watery, and so when you dice them, and especially if you salt them, and then they sit in anything salty, like, more of that liquid gets pulled out of the tomato. Um, but this was not like that at all, so I had to experiment with ways to, like, pull the moisture out of the tomato before you started adding ingredients to it, so it just, it wasn't soggy. Um, but it had this beautiful, the same texture of a traditional beef tartare. It was finely diced. Um, so that's gonna be the next video that I put out there, this tomato tartare dish. Um, that, <laughs> again, there's so much um, prep involved, like multi-hour prep where you're just letting the tomatoes sit and trying to pull the, um, the moisture out of it. Like, I don't know how realistic it really is. Um, but it is delicious and it's just interesting. Um, and I like foods that tend to be party trick type foods where you set it down in front of people and they're like, wait, what is this? And then you get to tell this whole story. Um, and it's just interesting. So, um, yeah, so Christopher, um, since you're a member, have you been watching um, any of the egg and chicken classes? Because I have a lot of that to update. Um, I've been producing classes on a platform called Skillshare which is like an annual subscription type of a thing for students. But once you have that subscription, you can watch everything on the platform. Um, and they're really supportive of their instructors and um, in terms of teaching you like what works really, really well for, you know, their students and their platform and how students enjoy consuming content and actually learning things. So um, I feel like my whole process for creating content and teaching content um, has grown over the last few months and I'm ready to, or I'm excited to work that into some of the YouTube um, content as well. But, um, have you responded, Christopher? I don't see any of your messages. Yeah, by the way, like, I don't really know where to find messages on this thing. Show me, why can't you show me all of them? That's chat viewing. Hmm. Oh, oh, you haven't caught up with them yet. When you retire. <laughs> Yeah, so retirement is a fun topic of conversation. Just in my couple of trips to Spain, I've decided I think that's where I eventually want to retire. Um, I like the food, the country's gorgeous. Um, I'm trying to learn French because my husband is French, so I figure if I can stick close enough to the French border or stay on the French side and just hop over to Spain when I want. Um, that when I'm old and don't care about people, <laughs> that's that's where I'll go. I'll just eat and drink my way into old age. But uh, yeah, I like the idea of sitting on a balcony somewhere with a little glass of rosé or vermouth and watching the world go by. Yeah, but um, there's a lot of... So I, with the Skillshare, so if, if you're watching this to this point, the membership that I have here on YouTube um, gets you access to these more focused classes, um, you know, cook the best eggs and cook the best chicken, um, where I am doing largely what I do here on the channel, but like I say, just more focused on this type of food. Um, we'll cover a technique on how to cook, you know, eggs or chicken, um, and then we'll cover some of the classic recipes that use that technique. So like cook the best eggs, <laughs> it's hundreds, hundreds of recipes because of all the different techniques. Um, so I started with poached and I just on Skillshare, like I broke them down into, you know, inch wide, mile deep 
approach. So um, the first class on Skillshare was poached eggs. So I experimented with a few of the ways that they say you know, is the best way to poach eggs. Do you put vinegar in the water? Do you strain it? The swirl method, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then stumbled upon a really interesting method where you, I guess it's like marinating or even soaking the raw eggs in a water and vinegar mixture for about 10 minutes. And I think it's the same concept as um, a ceviche, where the vinegar is more or less cooking the proteins, like having them seize up, but without using any heat. And so that keeps all of the whites together uh, after a few minutes, and then you can put it into the boiling water and that gets you like these smooth rounded edges um, on your whites. And so that was really fun to come across um, in research for that class. That's one of the things I get to update on the membership. So poached eggs is pretty thorough. Um, and then I did omelets, frittatas, and quiche, since those are all really similar. Um, also super broad, because like you can put anything in an omelet and a frittata. Um, and so what, it was hard for me to get started on that one, because I was just trying to decide like what combinations do I focus on. So um, that's another one that can just grow exponentially over time. So I you know, just have to start somewhere and put it out there. Um, but also there's these fun moments, when I say fun, I think I mean that sarcastically, where you can read a recipe and they're like, it's a traditional Provencal frittata and it's called trushub and it's like eggs and Swiss chard. And, um, and so my husband, who's from the south of France, I was like, hey, I, you've never told me about this thing. And he's like, I have, I've never heard of this before. So, um, does someone in Provence make this thing and it's called Trusha? Yeah, it, absolutely. But is it fair to be like, it's a Provencal thing? Like, oh, I don't think so. So that's really hard to sift through when it's not your home culture, or you don't have access to it. Um, I'm trying to be accurate with these things. There's also like a, an omelet called the Parisian omelet, which is it's delicious. It's mushrooms, ham, and cheese, like Gruyere, Emmental, or Comte, or some, something like really Swiss and creamy. Um, but you can't go to Paris and be like, can I have the Parisian omelet? Like, the, unless it's an item on the menu, like they probably don't call it Parisian. So I assume someone outside of Paris or even France started coining it the Parisian omelet because that is a typical combination in a crepe, a mushroom, ham, and cheese crepe, crepe. Um, but I don't even think they call the crepe um, Parisian. But so maybe that's where someone was like, oh, this is like Paris. Um, so I try to be careful with that when I'm choosing the recipes that I put in these courses. Like, are you really a thing? Are you really a thing there? Um, and I did quiche Lorraine because that's a traditional quiche. Um, but again, like, what are the traditional food combinations? And I say traditional as in like, there is a name and like a set standard of ingredients for it. Um, and quiche Lorraine is one of those, even though like once, once you get into it, people are like, there aren't onions in a traditional quiche Lorraine, but I haven't seen a recipe without onions yet. So I don't know what that means. What else do I need? Lipstick, Jenna needs lipstick. So in the meantime, like I got behind on producing YouTube videos because number one, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's work like to constantly come up with content ideas, like what recipe do I look up and film and then doing the research on it and the actual filming. The process is that I will cook and film and then I do a rough edit of all of the cooking actions that I want in the video. And that's also usually if I want to actually demonstrate a particular thing, I need to make sure that I have the right footage of that, that you can see what I'm doing and you know what I mean. And then I write a script based on that. Um, and then I will film the talking head part where, you know, this literally as it sounds. Um, and I always script it out beforehand because I don't, like you can see like my, the cadence and the pattern of how I speak here. I can stop mid thought and like restart a sentence. Um, and I will get on tangents and 
topics will wander. And I didn't want to do that on the YouTube videos because I wanted to give concise information. Um, I wanted it to move. Oh, hold on. Here's my dog. She's awake from a little nap on the bed. That's Navy. Hi, sleepy puppy. Um, so that's why I write the script, um, just to stay concise on things. And actually there's a lot of days where I just can't remember the right words for things. And I didn't want to waste your time while I was trying to think of the word. So we script all of that out. And then there's the final edit where I put all of this together. And then if there's you know, text on screen that I'm putting or other extra graphics, that's extra time to decide, am I putting this extra stuff there? Um, there's the still photo photography part of it. I had take a still photo for the thumbnail and then for the website blog and things like that. And I prefer videography over photography, but um, you know, photography has its benefits as well, but it, it just takes extra time to arrange all of that um, differently if you're gonna do the food photography properly. And so um, this is a multi, multi-step process to just produce the one video and um, really just feeling kind of deflated at the effort again in coming up with the ideas of things to film, which is why I wanted to start doing the lives um, where I get to just talk to camera because I never do that on the channel. I'm always teaching a recipe. And um, hold on, that falls. And usually when I'm just getting right to the point, which I consider part of my branding and something that I really like about what I do, uh, that doesn't leave a lot of space for you to get to know me or me to get to know you guys. So if the lives can catch on, then I would really like to do more of that. That's the whole point of YouTube, right? Is to build a community. So I think that's an element that I've missed all these years on the channel. Um, post film editing. How long does post film editing take? So the first round when i'm just doing the rough edit i'm just pulling out those action clips from the cooking footage um in the beginning probably took at least an hour um, some of that is because my computer doesn't cooperate and it slows down and it takes time to think and it can't move as fast as like my mind and my mouse are moving um, and it gets frustrated and slows down. Some of that is because in the early days when I would film the cooking process, I would just turn on my camera, start recording, and I would just cook. And then when I'm going through the footage, I would have to be scrubbing through 20, 30, 40 minutes of cooking, looking for the right action clips that I wanted to showcase. I have since changed how I film, which speeds up the editing process. I will now only film when I know I'm doing an action that I want um, to include in the video. And that means that I have shorter clips when I import them into the editing software. And then I'm just like shortening those clips, you know, from taking out that beginning in the middle and the end. So I just have the meat of the middle that I want. Um, that does make it considerably easier and it also sets me up for if I ever want to outsource the editing, which I really don't know how I would because I have to do this rough edit anyway to do the scripting. And so why would I outsource the final bit? Once I get the talking head part down, um, I can film that in one take. So that's just a matter of clipping the beginning and the end of that particular script and importing it and then making sure that those cooking action clips match up to the point where I'm saying it in the script. Um, I'm trying to get better at adding more script if I have extensive amount of B-roll and like just so there is less of that problem solving or troubleshooting when I'm in the editing of like, oh, I don't have enough B-roll and I'm talking a lot. Is there anything else I can add? Is this too much B-roll? Should I show my face now? Um, sometimes that can take, and it's really not so much about time as it is that mental energy when you're thinking and having to make a bunch of decisions. Like you can become overwhelmed with decision fatigue as well through this process um, and just, you know, setting up, you know, in my filming production in the beginning can make all of this a little quicker, but just not as much, uh, not as many decisions to make in, in the process because I set myself up better to begin with. That final editing somehow, again, takes another hour. Like I, when I'm thinking about it, I don't understand why it takes so long because these videos are only a few minutes long. Like, why does it take an hour? 
Um, and I think a lot of it is when you do work like this or any creative work, um, even especially with writing, um, you need time away from it to process and then to come back to it and, and tweak it and polish it a little bit more. And um, that time away from it is equally important, is, is, should equally be considered work as the time that you're spending like actually working on the project. And um, my stepping away, honestly, is usually jumping on um, like TikTok or Instagram, like I'm scrolling through social media and you can get sucked into that and half an hour passes before you realize like I've been watching this for a while. Um, and so I'm trying to get better at like, what other things can I do when I'm giving myself, you know, 10 minutes of mental space from this particular task um, that won't get me sucked in for half an hour or something. So um, I now try to, I have a keyboard now for my iPad. So I literally have my iPad set up here and then like my computer set up in front of me. So either if my computer starts thinking or I'm exporting something that's taking a couple of minutes and I know that my attention span is gonna get tired of waiting and it's gonna wanna do something and I can't jump onto social media cause I'll get sucked into it for too long. I will turn to my iPad and like write an email and I keep to-do lists. I have tons of scrap paper of little to-do lists around. Like anytime I think about, I need to do this, I write it down and it's this pile of little pieces of torn up paper in front of me on my desk. Um, so when I have these moments of, I want to do something, but not start another project, I have this tiny little list of, oh yeah, I need to write that person or look up that one thing or something. And, um, and that helps me feel like my day is much more productive. Um, and I'm also working on the mindset side of things of like, you know, even just sitting there and waiting for a video to export is that's work that that is being productive you know we don't have to always be in this hyper mode of productivity in order to feel like we've been a successful day or that we were good at our work that day um and so i'm working on that for myself being a little more compassionate about an understanding of of my process you know the time takes what it takes and um while i want to to be efficient in my process i also don't need to stress myself out about it you know youtube is the whole idea is that it needs to be fun. And if it's not fun for me, it's not fun for you guys. And then like, why would you be here? Um, so those are all little things that have gone through my head. And one of the reasons that I, I took some time off, um, they say that taking time off of YouTube doesn't hurt, you know, search rankings or anything like that. So I figured let's try it. Let's give ourselves a little mental break and, um, you know, worked on other projects that have to be you know, time intensive or focus intensive in the beginning. And then kind of once you get through that initial thing, then you can take a break later on and move on to other things. And so that's what we've been trying. But in the meantime, in addition to like the cooking video stuff, um, like the video courses um, for the membership here on YouTube and on Skillshare, and um, I've also got into monetizing the skill that I built with you know, cooking on camera and then editing, you know, cooking videos uh, and have been making videos for um, brands and, and private clients, like a blogger or two here and there. Um, but doing recipe demos, you know, for brands with like, I have a pasta sauce client. I have a, um, one of those baking kit companies where you order the kit and everything that you need comes in it. Um, so that's been really fun. There's a lot of cool things out there. A lot of great people out there it's it's satisfying to work with small businesses um they are so excited to see their product on camera and um it's fulfilling for me to see them get excited about their own product so i've been doing that in the meantime and that has also helped me tighten up my whole process um, but there are just certain things that i've decided about my editing process and like how how I'm presenting myself and how I present the content on the YouTube channel that I just don't want to change. Um, and so I just accept that it's going to take me a little bit longer. And if that means that I produce fewer videos, um, then that's it. Yeah. Pre-shooting time, script, recipe selection, and prep. Because I don't like sit down and, and do the recipe selection all at one time, it's usually something where 
I'm sitting on the subway, you know, I've got 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, and I'll think like, let's just look up some stuff. And so there are some tools that will show you, um, recipes have seasons, you know, because food can have seasons, especially if there's an upcoming holiday or something like that. You can maximize the potential web traffic that you can bring when people start searching for certain things. Like I have a video about ramps, which is really only popular for like six weeks out of the year. But when it's popular, it's like one of my, it is probably the highest traffic, trafficked video for just a few weeks out of the year. And so it'd be great. You know, like okra is like that. Okra is actually like that for a good six to eight months out of the year because it has a rotating season throughout the world. Um, but you know, researching things like that, there are tools that will tell you like these months are good for these types of recipes. It helps food bloggers as well. Um, the problem with that is when the food is seasonal, you have a very short window at the very beginning of the season of that food to, to cook the recipe, to produce your video and put it out there so that you can take advantage of the upcoming traffic. For me and my videos, I usually don't see that immediate turnaround like that year. It would be a year after I published it or even up to three years after I publish it before it picks up enough traffic that the algorithm has the data it needs to realize, okay, people really like this video and then it really promotes it. So it can be three, four, five years after I produce a video before it gets substantial traffic um, and attention. So, um, but back to your question about researching recipes, like that's one approach that I will take to recipes of um, like seasonally what's coming up, um, you know, and do I have the time to produce this while it's in season or before it goes out of season? And then like, okay, you know, this particular food is in season, what do we wanna do with it? And I'll just start looking through recipes and I'll have to decide like, am I in the mood to make this? Like, do I actually think I would enjoy this? Um, and that, while it doesn't take a lot of time, technically, there's a lot of that mental energy where you're trying to just, like you're just, reading the recipe and like making this decision of like, mm, I don't know that I like that ingredient. But then again, it's with these, all these other things and I have to learn to try and just that whole process, uh, the back and forth in your own mind is tiring. And then, yeah, once you decide what recipe you're gonna do, like are there other variations? And I always go back and forth of, should I like test a couple of recipes before I film this? Um, but ultimately that's, that's gonna slow down my whole process and take some of the joy out of it for me. So I've just decided, no, we're just, we're going to choose the recipe and jump into it and film it. Um, I never practice a recipe before I film it. What you see is the first time that I'm doing it. Um, as I read the recipe, um, just like you would be, that's again, part of the approach that I wanted was, is this recipe well written? Um, you know, or if you, you know, I made a mistake and if you make a mistake, it's fine. This is how it turns out. Like I wanted to be documenting that real time process. Um, so I guess all in all, like I would say that can take two to four hours. And then there's the actual like, I mean, I gotta make the grocery list. I gotta go to the grocery store. I gotta prep all the food, um, set up my filming area. You know, setting up my filming area I've is another place that I've tried to become more efficient. Um, I'm trying to remove challenges and barriers to filming more often. Um, just because there are certain things that are just gonna take more time and energy and I just have to accept that those parts will never change. So let me create more grace and ease where I can. Um, and so I do have a pretty good filming setup um, for what you guys see and that's that's in my um, guest bedroom slash office. And um, so I have different surfaces that I can film on just to create some visual variety. Um, and I cook on an induction top, which is fine and it's not my favorite but um it does it's not hot like because of the way induction creates heat you know it it creates heat through magnetism basically so while the pot can be hot and like the food in it obviously gets cooked and heated up uh, the cooktop itself doesn't retain a lot of heat and that works really well for me so that I can easily move it out of the way. I'm not spending time waiting for it to cool down or I don't have to grab, you know, oven mitts or something to move it out of the way. Um, that was, that kind of ease and efficiency was really important to me when creating my cooking setup. So, you know, the recipes can, you know, they take what they take, but yeah, when you're filming and also 
being aware, being conscious of how things look, you know, a visual setup. Um, I don't put a lot of effort into where my ingredient bowls are placed or something like that. Um, I'm just cooking. Um, unless it's, you know, an ingredient setup at the very beginning, which I, I don't do a lot of, or it's, you know, the final dish shot, like I might want that to look a little more posed or choreographed. Um, but for the most part, my visual style is evolving to be more like, um, I just like the food and I really like being up in the food. Um, I respond really well to that. I like thinking about how good that food must taste and the details in it. So I am developing my um, creative you know, video photography style um, to be more about that. Um, yeah, yeah, and so um, Christopher says, I noticed that you let the mistake stand, yeah. Um, I do think that's important. Um, I, I, over time, have learned that I get more value out of other people's mistakes. Um, that knowing what to do, knowing what not to do is equally, if not more important than what to do. Oh, my dog is fluffing up the clean clothes we have on the bed so she can lay on them and get them dirty again. Um, yeah, so I, I did decide to, to do that. Um, I think my most famous example of that is in a Southern caramel cake recipe where you literally make caramel uh, and pour it over your cake and then the caramel softens, let's say hardens, it softens into place as the frosting. Um, but sugar work is incredibly precise and you, you need to do it regularly to build uh, the muscle memory and like the visual memory of how things are supposed to look or feel in order for it to be right. And then also because of the actual action of, you know, you're cooking the caramel, it has to cool for a certain amount of time and then you're putting it on the cake and like you have to spread it around like on top and then on the sides, all of that, all of those, those few extra seconds or a couple of minutes can completely change the texture of the caramel and the frosting and how it behaves once it's on the cake. And um, if you don't know what you're doing, it can be one of the most frustrating experiences uh, for a baker or a cook. And um, so I, for the video, it was like the first time I was making it, or maybe like the second time in my life in like 10 years or something. So um, I ran into the issue where the frosting started to harden before I could spread it into place. And so I realized though that like, while I couldn't, pull it off of the cake and reheat it, um, I could heat up a metal spatula by dipping it into boiling hot water and having that metal even just temporarily heat up in the hot water and then have a little bit of the hot water still in the spatula and then that would help smooth out the caramel and that took like an extra hour. Um, but I had a beautiful looking cake afterwards and I decided to put all of that in the video because I was like, okay, if I did this and like, I know what I'm doing, even though I'm not like an expert on sugar work. Um, I can't imagine for people who like to cook or bake and like aren't as as good in a crunch or don't know how to troubleshoot something like that, this could be very valuable for them. Um, and it is really satisfying to get that feedback from people of like, it was really great to see how you fix something when it went wrong. Um, so baking is a little more difficult to fix things that go wrong because it's so precise, so scientific, you know, you got chemical reactions going on. Um, but in cooking, there's so much space to correct mistakes. Um, and, you know, it just kind of turns it into something different as opposed to it being wrong. So, um, but I do, again, I want to remove that type of a barrier for new cooks, um, a, a barrier to potential confidence. Um, it does not need to be perfect to be good. Um, I think if we can look back at some of our favorite foods by, um, you know, our parents or our grandparents, you know, we have no idea what it was supposed to be like. We just know that that's how they did it all the time. And so you built a preference for that dish based on 
that, that constant exposure to it. And so it becomes that tradition. It becomes that memory for you. And like now that you see that, like I, it has to be this way because this is how I always had it. Um, and deviations from that aren't wrong. They're just different. Um, but for all you know, you were experiencing it incorrectly. It was just how your particular family did it. And so it becomes your correct version of that. Um, I think things like that are really, really, really interesting. There's like an anecdote about um, a girl was learning to cook and her mom was like, yeah, it was like a, a beef butt or something. I don't know, it was like a big chunk of meat. And so the mom's like, yes, yeah, so you cut the ends off and then you, you know, you cook this part. And like, I forget what they did with the ends, but basically the mom, the girl was like, why do I cut the ends off? And she's like, I don't know. That's just how my mom always did it. Ask her. So she asked her grandmother, why did you cut the ends off? And she's like, I don't know, that's just how my mother always did it. And um, as it turned out, you know, the first person that they saw doing it, like that she, her pan wasn't big enough to fit the whole thing. So that's why she was cutting the ends off. Um, so it would fit in the pan, but like no one ever thought to ask, like, why do I do this? Do I have to do this? Um, it was just simply a matter of it fitting in the dish. So there's a number of those, in. It, as an example, you know, in other family recipes, um, someone just did it a certain way out of necessity or, you know, whatever. And then it just kind of became um, part of that tradition. So, um, but yeah, you're exactly right, Chris, to that point. So um, I love those stories behind food. I think um, sometimes I think like if I had known that I was gonna be this into food earlier in life, I might've become a food historian or, um, or something, hold on, my dog, what do you want? What do you want, Nugget? Do you want to get down? Do you want to get down? We can't have you jumping down. Hold on. Okay, you want to, do you want to come down or not? <laughs> come on, let's go. Let's go, let's get you down, honey. Ready? Okay, go girl. All right. My dog has, um, oh, it is almost time for your lunch. And then her walk. Um, well, guys, I'm, I'm going to sign off. I'm going to give my dog her lunchy lunch. She knows that word and is very excited. And then we're going to go on a walky walk. <laughs> so thanks for joining in for my first live. And um, hopefully I can arrange more of these and talk more about the things we find interesting. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.